Fresh Tracks Weekly is back. Last week I was out, so we missed an episode, but had some good times at a wedding, hanging out with family. Upon our return, Kara and I needed a little mountain therapy, so we went backpacking into this mountain lake with some friends. It was a good time. Ton of snow still up high, though, it turns out. The lake had thawed out just enough where we could still catch a few brook trout. Good dinner there with the, with the trout. Climbed some peaks. Life was good. Good to be in the mountains and excited for what's to come this summer. Randy and Kim got out and put the hurtin' on some walleye. Looked like a blast. I mentioned in the last episode that Jace stayed up in Alaska after filming Randy's bear hunt. So we're gonna get a little update on how that all went down. I had a great time filming Randy on his bear hunt with his brother and niece and then when they flew out, I actually stayed in town for another week and then my parents and my girlfriend Chloe came up and met. And we stayed out there for a full week, did a lot of fishing. Um, the salmon were running up a stream that I had fished previously in the past and so we did pretty well. We caught a few salmon and that was a lot of fun. We did take a couple days to look for some bears because I also had a bear tag, but we had no luck on the bears, but we came home with some fish, so I can't complain. Michael continues to rack up the day's fishing, so let's catch up with him. Let's head on over to the fishing corner. How we doing today? A beautiful Friday. All right, guys, it's been a couple weeks. River's starting to, to mellow out a little bit, but last week did a little bit of high water fishing, caught a few trouts in, uh, in some really dirty high water, finding that slack stuff. You can really be successful catching a lot of fish in the single hole. And besides that, been fishing the creek a little bit, caught a few fish in the creek, went to a secret spot with my girlfriend, and she caught this really nice brown that we'll show you on the screen. I'm on day 102 was yesterday. So making my way downtown, walking fast, and just trying to fish as much as I can until I'm home now. <laughs> Anyways, uh, but yeah, the, for uh, the future, just going to continue to watch those water levels. The rivers are really starting to come in and look great here. Uh, doing some lake fishing as well and been tying flies, doing the whole dang thing. So uh, thanks for tuning in this week. Uh, back to you, Marcus. Now we will jump into some news. So I saw on the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation website that they recently sat down with the North Carolina governor, along with some students, to advocate for wildlife crossing structures in the state of North Carolina. And this is interesting because the wedding I was just at was in North Carolina, and I was kind of surprised to see how much interest there were in elk in the area. There was a lot of marketing from businesses around elk, and people were very excited to look for elk when we were in the Great Smoky National Park. It's just cool to see that there's so much interest in reestablishing elk in parts of the world that are largely urbanized. And that was another thing I was surprised about though. There is a substantial amount of public land and, and open land out there as well, but definitely a different system than what I'm used to out west. So cool to see that, never been there before. One of the projects that RMEF is advocating for is the I-40 Pigeon River Gorge Wildlife Crossing Project. They have a number of proposed spots to build wildlife crossings or tunnels or something to mitigate the issue of the barrier that I-40 creates. And so there's a ton of traffic that travels up and down this interstate proven to be a significant barrier from restricting wildlife traveling back and forth between the Great Smoky National Park and other adjacent public lands. So these crossing structures can be a great tool. There's some interesting research that's been done showing just how well they can work if done properly. So hopefully the interest in North Carolina elk continues to grow and uh, n along with other wildlife. These, these passages don't just benefit elk, they benefit all sorts of wildlife from black bears to deer to small mammals, everything uh, benefits from having more connectivity and movement. So hopefully there's continued interest in this and can get some cool stuff done in North Carolina. In a previous episode, I alluded to the fact that green energy doesn't always mean that it's great for wildlife or their habitat. I totally understand that we do need energy, but I think it's a good idea to diversify energy sources and know the consequences of putting those projects in place. I am glad to see that people are looking into some of the consequences that these energy developments are having on wildlife. A study was recently published that looked into the effects that wind turbines have on killing bats and how there can be cascading effects throughout the ecosystem when bats are removed. In the study, they were able to examine the carcasses of bats that were killed by the turbines, and they looked at their stomach contents. They found that 20% of the insects that were consumed were known pests that damage agriculture and trees. 
So it's easy to think that, you know, maybe killing a few bats isn't going to have that much of an effect. Uh, but to help put it in perspective, here's a few bat statistics and facts that I, I like to reference. Bats have a crazy high metabolism. They eat a lot to sustain themselves. Some small bats can catch more than a thousand insects per hour. So the species little brown bat eat a variety of insects, but it's not uncommon for an individual to eat 500 mosquitoes in a night. So the average colony size of little brown bats is about 9,000. That's four and a half million mosquitoes per night, 135 million mosquitoes a month. And that's just mosquitoes. That's not counting all of those other insects that they're also consuming. The moral of the story is that if you kill a bunch of bats, you could have a pretty dramatic impact on the ecosystem. And while wind turbines might not kill a ton just by themselves, it's just one more thing that's adding to the long list of things that can affect bat populations and have cascading effects down. Georgia Representative Andrew Clyde, along with 53 co-sponsors, have introduced a bill essentially to repeal the Pittman-Robertson Act. The Pittman-Robertson Act, of course, is an excise tax on hunting equipment with the majority of the money coming from sales of firearms and ammunition. This is an excise tax that's placed at the manufacturing level. The money goes towards wildlife conservation. Representative Clyde's argument is that taxation on firearms and ammunition is unconstitutional and that it appears to be their response to a lot of the recent legislation towards gun control. Uh, the thing that bums me out is wildlife is getting caught in the crossfire of this back and forth political battle. Pittman Robertson, along with Dingle Johnson, both these excise taxes on hunting equipment and fishing gear have contributed so much to wildlife and fisheries conservation. Uh, before now, I feel like they've, these programs have largely been championed and they've been viewed as extremely successful funding mechanisms. So hopefully everyone realizes how bad of an idea this is and it dies before it gains any traction. It's early stages, so time will tell, we will see. In a previous episode, I talked about how 40,000 acres of land and nearly nine miles of river frontage was gonna be opened up to the public in Wyoming. Well, apparently Wyoming's governor doesn't like this idea, he's not happy about it, and is appealing the Bureau of Land Management Acquisition. This calls for a deeper dive. We're gonna get Randy in here to give us some more details on what's going on. I was very excited about this mm -hmm. 35,000 acre acquisition by the BLM. Gonna add near 40, Casper. Yeah, 40,000 of inaccessible BLM. So you add it all together, it's over 75,000 acres. Is that that? I thought it was 40,000 total. If mm. I, oh, really? Okay, no, yes. Yeah, 35 plus, or almost 36 plus 40. Yeah, it's uh, a, a huge chunk, and then almost it was 8.8 .8 miles on the North Platte River opened yeah. up. The number one wild trout fishery in Wyoming. Yeah. So. That would have been pretty sweet. Like, I mean, I hope it still is pretty sweet, but what's going on? So, <laughs> Well, as you know, the, the Conservation Fund, in partnership with the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, put this deal together. So they go out, they put a deal together, they get a buy-sell in place under whatever terms, and then they put down some money to hold it, and then they work with a federal agency to take it over, or a state agency. Well, out west we have these politicians that subscribe to a borderline religious belief called no net gain. And it's under the premise that we shouldn't have any more public land. That just, that's how they feel. Right. Which, if you want to feel that way, that's fine. But don't try to BS me about why you feel that way. And it, here's the smoke and mirrors of it all. They say, well, this takes property, private land, off the tax rolls. Right, which it does in a way, but there's... Yeah. Oh, yeah, go on. So <laughs> is that... this is where, you know, if you're going to argue taxes, mm -hmm. I, I'm your guy. Just yeah. come on down. Let's argue taxes, Governor right. Gordon or whoever wants, you know. The, the, right now, the pressure's coming from the the governor of Wyoming. Mm -hmm. He's getting pressure from his constituents and his legislative group that has this no net gain philosophy. So if you're familiar with how property taxes are in the agricultural West, we have these agricultural exemptions, which I support because, you know, if you start taxing a, a farm or a ranch as residential development, right. they can't afford it. And pretty soon, guess what? You are going to have residential development. There. Right. So I'm okay with that. Well, the formula says, instead of charging you or assessing you at the highest and best use, 
Tell us what the land produces, you know, how many AUMs or how many tons of hay or how many bushels of grain. And they have a formula that converts that mm -hmm. to an assessed value. Right. And then they apply these low agriculture rates to it. Yeah. So, so it's like 35,000 <clears throat> acres of deeded land. Right. And Paid $10,600 of property tax. Right. So and to give you some idea. So that's, this, and that's the lost revenue that they're talking right, about. They, so they Ten, lose, they'd lose ten, if, if this was transferred to the BLM. They lose $10,600 of property tax revenue between the two counties that the property sits in. Right. For a little perspective, this building we're sitting in that I pay the property tax on, Yeah. we pay $8,900 a year. Yeah. So, but let, let's then, regardless of that yeah so let's then do the calculation the federal government has two programs that they pay local governments the equivalent of property taxes for the blm it's called pilt p-i-l-t payment in lieu of taxes right and with the forest service it's called srs secure rural schools because most of this money goes to school systems so last year the BLM paid Wyoming a dollar and seventy-two cents per acre, the equivalent. Right. So you do the math on the thirty-five thousand acres that would leave the tax rolls, and the BLM last year would have paid these counties sixty thousand dollars at a dollar and seventy-two cents an acre. Yeah, and is that the? Is, I mean. Obviously, sixty thousand dollars is way better than ten thousand. But is it a, is it a separate pool of like was that ten thousand paid to the same to the county in the same way too? Pretty like, much. It's like it, yeah. it's the, there's a formula for how the pilt money gets allocated yeah. between the state and the county, but the county gets the majority of it, and right. even the stuff that goes to the state a lot of times gets regranted out to the counties. Right. But you, it's obvious that they're trying to make it look like it's a way bigger deal than it is. Because right. even just the last $10,000, it's like, think about how much gain you would have in recreation right. value to and the local economy. And this, there's a lot of added benefits outside of the lost $10,000 in taxes. But then with PILT as well, it's like, seems right. like a no-brainer. So It is from a tax standpoint. And then the other thing is, anytime there are federal revenues or, or revenues that come from federal lands, up to 35% of that is shared back to the state and local governments. Mm -hmm. So they're going to continue to keep this in what's called multiple use. They've already stated that. You know, right. that'll be grazing. It might have some oil and gas development. Who knows? Whatever. But any money that comes from that, the accounting says we got to take up to 35%. And depending on the type of revenue, it's 35 yeah. or 30 or whatever. That goes back to the counties also. So this number of do I want sixty thousand or do I want eleven, you know, ten thousand six hundred, that doesn't take in account, like you said, the the recreate the economic value of all this recreation. It doesn't take into account the revenue share. Right. But it sounds good when you got a bunch of people in front of you who are cheering you on and you're a politician and you say, I don't want any more public land. And I see. I mean, I, th I feel like one of the arguments that a lot of times they make is that it's a lost way of lifestyle. You're, you know, you're. It. it I mean, right? Would you agree that that's yeah, kind that, of like that, the the narrative that they like to play yeah. out? But it's a willing seller, right? right? Mm -hmm. Like that landowner didn't. It's not like it was. Yeah. They didn't take it from him. It was a right. willing seller, and then it's not. This land is still going to be leased out to cattle grazing. Mm -hmm. Like somebody else is going to, somebody's probably going to get a new lease, or whether mm -hmm. I don't know what landowner yeah. will be there, but somebody's going to bid that and right. graze cattle on it, and yeah. it just won't be developed now. Right. You know, and in, in the, and the traditional, it might, and it might be still there. like you said, it could still have oil and gas leases. It could be mm -hmm. whatever, but the public can go on it and enjoy it and have access right. to nine miles of Premier River and right. And the reason this is so important, and I'm glad that you brought it up for your, your show, is this is happening all over the West. You have these politicians who've been uh, almost indoctrinated without looking at the numbers. Yeah. And then when they get shown the numbers, like a lot of us who are involved in this stuff, we go and like, hey, look at these numbers. Well, you know, I had a fake news or, you know, whatever the hell they want to say. Right. So once they buy into it, it's almost like, well, I already raised my hand. I can't change my mind. 
Yeah. And so where you and Michael went bear hunting a couple of years ago, there's a parcel there that yeah. the Elk Foundation put together and the county commissioners who had a serious conflict of interest about not wanting the public to have access to those lands, they did everything in their power under this same exact argument that made no sense financially. Yeah. So imagine if you are the governor of Wyoming opposing this and you say, well, county, I think you should deal with eleven, ten thousand, six hundred dollars $10,600. You shouldn't get this 60000 Yeah. Hello? <laughs> I mean... If someone would let me trade all my $10 bills for $50 bills, <laughs> I'd be down, I'd be, I'd run the teller dry. <laughs> that, that's what's happening here. Yeah. But it's, it, it's reached the point in the West with some people and some groups where it's almost like a religious belief. And I would want working landowners. Do you think if a billionaire goes and buys this place, Right. He's going to run it as a working ranch. You think he's going to let some adjacent neighbor come and have a lease at whatever we're at right now, a dollar and something per AUM? Yeah. No. So it's, uh... it's, it's strictly a BS facade. So I, I get pretty worked up about it. I'm sorry that I, you know, my blood pressure gets up with this, but I've, I've sat in enough of these discussions with legislators and with local government people and what they usually tell me is well you don't understand oh really i'm a cpa i, I do this stuff i help clients file for ag exemptions what don't i understand well you just don't understand <laughs> i still i evidently i still don't understand so that's a challenge we face in trying to create public access in the west you have groups like the Conservation Fund, like the Nature Conservancy, the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, the Trust for Public Lands, all these big land trusts. They have staff out here putting together deals like this, building relationships with landowners, mm -hmm. willing buyer, willing seller relationships. And then they get torpedoed like this. And I think your point of, well, why should you tell that landowner who they can or cannot sell to? Right. If we're all about property rights, and I am, why would we remove one of the potential buyers for that landowner? Right. Yeah, it's crazy. So what do you think the future of this is? I mean... This transaction? The governor appealed to BLM's decision mm -hmm. or acquisition. So what do you know what the process is moving the, forward? The from process here? will be the BLM will consider the, the appeal or okay. the protest. And they'll make a decision, yes or no. Gotcha. Unfortunately, very often, the federal agencies defer to the local delegation of that state. Gotcha. So if Wyoming's two senators and congresspersons say, time out, we don't want this, there's a really good chance it'll go down in flames. What do you think the sentiment in Wyoming is? Like, do you think those locals are going to put pressure on their... I would imagine that a lot of people in Wyoming might put pressure on those politicians yeah, to... They are. I mean, you go out on our Hunt Talk forum and... Yeah. They're, they're, the Wyoming guys are just lighting them up, which I'm like, go get them, boys. Right. Uh, but if you don't live in Wyoming, this issue still affects you. And one of the things that happens is these ideologues, they go to the congressional appropriation process and they try to cut PILT funding. And so say, to make their argument stronger. Right. So that way, the, if... Say I, I'm one of these people who believe in no net gain. If I can get a seat on the appropriations committee and I can cut congressional funding to pay property taxes back to these counties, mm -hmm. it makes it easier for me to support my ideology. Right. So if you have a congressperson or a senator who is into this no net gain, light them up. Tell them the math doesn't work, and in effect, you're starving out the rural counties instead of helping them. Well, I guess we'll see with time, but I hope. Yeah. Let's check yeah. in on this in about six months. Yes, yeah, and that's the problem. It's just like sometimes these things fizzle, and then we won't hear about it for a while, and then it'll yeah. we'll hear more about it. So the, we'll, keep the, it, we'll try to keep an eye on it. Yeah, and one other part, you know, landowners... They, they really work hard at this, like this group selling this ranch. 
they've been waiting, they've been patient, because this process doesn't work fast. So every time you kill one of these in this way, it erodes the confidence that these private landowners, these conservation-minded private land stewards, right. it erodes their confidence that this process can work. Mm -hmm. And it just makes it harder to do, which again is part of the objective of the fringe element. So, Well, yeah, we'll keep an eye on it, but All right. for now, thanks for the update. I got to uh, go for a walk and blow off <laughs> some steam here. All right, well, thanks for watching. You can email us at weekly at freshtracks.tv. There you go.